Welcome to this, the fourth of Renew's six green rebuild toolkit webinars. Tonight's webinar is home energy setups for bushfire zones and climate resilience. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We encourage you to share in the chat the Aboriginal land from which you are joining us tonight. Also, we acknowledge that it's possible something you hear may be emotionally challenging for you. We encourage you to reach out for support if this occurs. One resource is Beyond Blue. They are available 24 seven and their number is 1-300-22-4646. That's 1-300-22-4646. Now to some housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. There are a couple of webinar functions we encourage you to use tonight. The chat function is on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Simply click, click on the icon to use the chat. It would be great, great, even if you haven't done so already, if you tested the chat function by sharing with others where you are reaching us from tonight. Next, the Q&A function is on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Similarly, click on the icon to open the window, type in your question and press enter. You can also upvote questions by pressing the thumbs up icons. I'll now give a brief introduction to the toolkit which sits behind this series of webinars. The Green Rebuild Toolkit is a project from Renew, a member-based nonprofit organization who have provided Australians with expert independent advice on sustainability since 1980. Renew also publishes two leading sustainability magazines, Renew and Sanctuary. Through this work, Renew has worked directly with designers, architects, and sustainability experts for over 40 years. The devastating bushfires of 2019 and 2020 prompted Renew to share some of the expert resources that have been collected along the way. And so the Green Rebuild Toolkit project began. It is intended as a platform to share Renew's expertise, to amplify other projects and people doing good work in this space and to share the stories of those rebuilding. The toolkit can be found online. It is divided into eight sections that walk readers through the process of rebuilding. You can read it chapter by chapter or jump to sections that interest you. Throughout it, you will find expert feature stories, buyer's guides and case studies. There are also many links to external resources which you can find in the blue boxes in the margins. Importantly, this toolkit is designed to grow and evolve. If you know of a project that you think should be included or would like to share your own rebuild story, please follow the links on the website. And now to tonight's program. We have three speakers tonight. They will each speak for from five, seven to 10 minutes approximately, after which we will have a Q&A, responding to questions you have posed in the Q&A function on your screen. I'll first introduce myself and then our three panelists for the evening. I live in far Eastern Victoria in Malakuta, a, excuse me, a remote coastal community profoundly impacted by the 2019-20 bushfires. I've volunteered for years in efforts to grow community and regional resilience. I'm coordinator of the Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group, a member of the Friends of Malakuta, and I present two weekly programs on 3MGB Wilderness Radio, our little volunteer community radio station. The first is from Little Things, where I celebrate the little things that happen in our community and in the outside world. The second is Healthy Conversations, where I chat with the local doctor about all manner of issues relating to our community's health and well-being. I also run Carbathon Consulting, a small practice where my focus is nurturing resilience, helping individuals, organizations, and communities create sustaining futures. I particularly like helping, I particularly like helping others develop their skills for living responsibly and responsively. Remarkably, since my husband and I moved to Melakuta 11 years ago from North Warrandyte in the bushy Northeast of Melbourne, our daughter, her husband and two youngsters and our son have also moved here. 
we were all here on New Year's Eve 2019. We chose to defend our daughter's property and to prepare the other two as best we could and leave them to whatever occurred. The fires came very, very close to both of our homes, but in no small, small part due to neighbors and emergency services, our properties were not lost and the defense of our daughter's home was also successful. 123 other families in our small community were not so fortunate. Our town has established a community-led recovery association and COVID willing, our plans for recovery are continuing to emerge. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker is Andy McCarthy. Andy is a lifelong advocate for renewable energy. With more than 20 years experience in the industry, Andy has played a key role in developing innovative and industry leading projects to accelerate the shift towards renewable energy, battery storage and electric vehicles. Andy founded Gippsland Solar with his wife Kelly in 2010, which was acquired by RACV in late 2019. As CEO of RACV Solar, Andy and his team have established RACV Solar as the benchmark across residential and commercial solar, and also the trusted voice for government and industry bodies to formulate policies and industry framework. Andy will give us an introduction to grid connected systems and hybrid systems, specifically solar and battery systems and how they perform in a bushfire context. Next, we will hear from Glenn Morris. Glenn, through his business SolarClip, has been installing renewable energy systems both on and off grid for over 25 years. Glenn consults for the Smart Energy Council, is their representative on Standards Australia EL-042 Committee, Renewable Energy Standards, has taught renewable energy courses at various technical institutes throughout Australia, was a board member and vice president of the Australian Solar Council, and has been a renewable energy system auditor for both Clean Energy Council and the New Zealand government. Glenn has lived off grid for much of the past 30 years. Glenn will introduce us to off grid systems, how they perform for fire resilience and how households may decide if it is the right choice. And lastly, I'll change my hat and become the final speaker for the evening. I think it's appropriate to introduce why I find myself speaking this evening. I've been passionate about sustainability my entire life for a long time without giving it any particular name. Since moving to Malakuta, a particular force in my community focus in my community involvement has become energy stability, reliability, can't speak tonight, stability, reliability, sustainability, and renewability. In short, energy resilience. Starting with a brief, brief reflection on resilience itself, I'll be providing an overview of Malakuta's ongoing journey to energy resilience, including a very, the very recent and exciting commissioning of a community battery and microgrid. Before Andy begins, I'll just remind you that all three presentations will run first, and then we will have a Q&A discussion with the panel members. If you want your question to be included, please make sure you put it in the Q&A, not the chat. And now to your first speaker, Andy McCarthy. Thank you, Tricia. Appreciate the warm introduction. Um, great to be amongst some very capable and wonderful people um, across the industry to give this presentation tonight. Allow me just to share my screen. Bear with me one second. Okay, looks like that's working. Uh, so I come to you from the land of the Gunai Kurnai, and I, I thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, Tricia, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I just uh, would also like to start by acknowledging the amazing work that Renew and formerly the ATA has done uh, for this industry uh, over a long period of time. Um, I was fortunate enough to cut my teeth in solar 20 years ago, uh, working for a gentleman by the name of Mick Harris, who was one of the, I believe, the original founders of the ATA and heavily involved in, um, the, tr in the transition to Renew. And uh, all along, they've been advocating for the same type of common sense um, aspects and initiatives that I'm so passionate about. It's amazing how much the sectors evolved in this time and yet a lot of the messages that um, you know Renew and the ATA have been putting out into market are still relevant to this day and, and you know a lot of things that don't need to cost money, just um, smart design and a real desire to you know tread a bit lighter on this planet. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be given the opportunity to speak tonight. 
Um, you know, I think the, the history of RM Gippsland Solar and now RECB Solar, I think Tricia has um, touched on and covered quite well, but um, from a purely, um, from a bushfire perspective, um, our business operates um, originally all through Gippsland and now all of Victoria. Um, but we have a strong presence uh, in the East Gippsland region. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of customers through that area. Um, we felt it um, as much as anybody um, through those awful times. Um, uh, you know, we, we've had staff um, away for months. We had customers lose homes. Um, we had family um, lose property as well. So it, it's still a little bit triggering to hear some of those stories and think about the, the feeling of helplessness that a lot of us felt um, at the time. So. It's, it's really nice actually to be circling back now and talking to some of these customers who are rebuilding their homes, um, you know, um, using smart design and renewable energy and, um, and to actually be helping them get on with the, uh, the next stage of their lives because it, um, it feels like it's just been a lot of, um, a lot of tragedy and a lot of heartache um, up, to, up to recently and now we're actually seeing the rebuild. So it's very, um, it's immensely rewarding to be now going through the rebuild with a lot of our clients. Okay, so um, I'd just like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the work that RECV Solar has done. Um, so we're very passionate at RECV Solar about uh, community, community first and foremost in everything that we do. Uh, we are a commercial business, but we do have, um, you know, we have a core values of looking after the community and improving the lives of all Victorians, which speaks to the original values that I had as, as we founded Gippsland Solar. So very proud, um, especially in the wake of the bushfires, we're able to do some really amazing work um, with certain organisations that have been hard hit uh, Goonga, a Wombat Orphanage, was one example. Um, as you can see there from that image there, they were so lucky. They had it coming from 270 degrees all around them, the bushfire, as it came into Goonga. Um, miraculously, they survived, but their um, existing off-grid system just wasn't cutting the mustard. Um, RECV's CEO, Neil Taylor, rang me the day after the bushfire, said, what can I do to help? Please just tell me if there's anything I can do to support this region. One of the first projects we came across was the Goonga Wombat Orphanage that obviously had a lot of need up there for um, repatriating wildlife and bringing them back to good health, but their off-grid system wasn't working. So um, we donated about $50,000 worth of product there. It was wonderful to go back and see them being able to store medicines and, um, and have electricity for internet um, running water and, and all the things that they'd really been struggling with unless it was a sunny day up to then. Um, so the project was particularly close to my heart, so it was wonderful to be able to support them. Uh, we did some similar work for the good people at the Ruthen Baton Rouge Wildlife Shelter. Um, that this um, so Goongara was actually off grid. Uh, Bruthen was grid connected, but obviously all the poles and wires were burnt out. So we were able to uh, design and implement uh, a portable solar system, as you can see in the background there, with some concrete feet um, as the ballast. Um, we engineered this, dropped it into site, and had power back onto the site within about 72 hours of them contacting us saying uh, we need to do something. Um, so we we're able to deploy really rapidly and get them um, back into reliable electricity supply. Uh, and then the mains are eventually reconnected and we're able to remove that system. Um, so again, another uh, situation where hopefully it helped to you know, do a lot of good work in the community. Another one, as Tricia touched on, was the Malakuta General Radio Station. Uh, another one that was particularly um, bittersweet for me personally, we actually installed a battery uh, backup system for Malakuta General Radio Station um, earlier in the year before the bushfires came. We gave them a battery that was all they could afford through some grant funding they had, but we knew at the time that it wouldn't be enough to provide meaningful electricity for, for days um, in, in such a situation as we unfortunately saw. Um, I'll never forget that call when uh, Land and my East Gippsland manager rang me to say that the power had gone off at the radio station as the fire was coming into town. I, I still feel sick in my guts just thinking about it. Um, so uh, once we got past the uh, emergency phase and we're into the a sort of disaster recovery phase, we um, were able to secure some funding and go and put in a battery that was three times the size of the existing one and a new generator as well. So now, uh, God forbid anything ever happens again, that they'll be more secure um, from an electricity point of view, which for an emergency broadcast, I don't need to tell you how important that is. Um, oh, that's sorry, that's the picture there I should have brought up. Um, the Omeo Recreation Reserve is another situation um, whereby uh, they were isolated from all the other towns. They lost electricity. Um, anyone that has been familiar with that story there knows how badly hit Omeo region was. Uh, we were able to come in and supply um, a 25 kilowatt system um, with a 40 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, so now they have three to four days of electricity supply for critical infrastructure. And they're using this as a community safer meeting place. So um, another story um, that I think, you know, will hopefully give them some peace of mind should these types of unfortunate um, situations happen again. 
So I just want to bring you a couple of situations of customers um, that were uh, impacted by the fires. And apologies for you know using the imagery that may be triggering for some people. I'm sure a lot of you have been through a, um, a pretty turbulent time. But um, Joe, uh, one of our customers in Sarsfield, just outside of Bensdale, um, he, um, he was very, very fortunate in the end. His house was under Edinburgh attack all night. Um, he just installed a Tesla Powerwall battery on the house to complement his existing solar system. Um, so the power went out at 6 p.m. Um, and he fought the fire all through the night. Um, his battery maintained electricity to the home, running water pumps and topping up tanks. Um, so you can see there that his property was really badly damaged, um, but he was able to protect his home. Um, he, he actually said afterwards that the battery turned from a money saver to a lifesaver at that point in time. So um, it, it's... It, 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 uh, it is good. It brings a lot of benefits, battery storage. But I think in that kind of situation, um, obviously, Joe was very happy that he made that decision to install battery storage. Um, and then he caught up with a bloke named Scott and explained to him what it was like to hold a hose. Um, so it was um, it was a story that gained a lot of traction out in the media, especially because, um, you know, there were so many around that were un so unfortunate. And Joe was one of the few people in town that still had electricity. Um, another two people that are very close to my heart, also from Malakuta, um, Phil Piper and Kate Jackson, um, actually used to live in Merby North, where I live now in Gippsland, uh, moved to Malakuta and we installed um, a solar system uh, and a battery uh, for Phil and Kate um, in 2019 as well. Um, we know the stories of how Malakuta was hit so hard by the bushfires and um, the terror that must have been going through people's minds, um, you know, in the, in the hours leading up to it. Um, we all know that the town lost power as well. Um, Malakut has obviously got a long transmission line in through a densely bushed area. Um, it's highly susceptible to power outages. And so uh, they did lose power for quite a long time uh, in the town. I think it was seven to 10 days afterwards. Um, so Phil and Kate had a, a power wall battery, um, which was able to keep the house running. One thing that we hadn't really considered was um, in a bushfire context, what happens to the solar power system. So it's great that you have 13.5 kilowatt hours of storage, but, but what's going to happen when you have them smoke and ash filling the sky uh, in the days um, after, the, after the fires and as it's rolling through? Um, we hadn't really done much research into that. Um, so we collected some data historically after the fires had gone through, we collected some data from Phil and Kate's system. Um, it had been generating about uh, 10 or 12 kilowatt hours on the 30th of December. Uh, so prior to the um, bushfires rolling through the region, um, all through that period where the sky was heavily affected by smoke and ash, they were still generating between three and four kilowatt hours uh, from an eight kilowatt system. So um, that was enough to keep their power uh, maintained to the home for 10 days. Um, Phil and Kate being the amazing people, community minded people that they are, um, they use their home as a community safe place. They had offered showers and, and hot cups of tea uh, one of, I think, three people I know of in town that had electricity in the time post the fires. Uh, so, you know, it's just wonderful to see the practical benefits of installing a battery um, and then what people with a, an amazing community mindset can then do with that, the reliable electricity and, and provide peace of mind for, for people around them. So I think it's, um, it's a wonderful story to come from a really horrible time. It's one of the things that I really reflect on um, is, you know, being able to provide that for Phil and Kate and what they can provide for the community in those awful times. So questions to consider uh, if you are building in a bushfire prone area, which a lot of regional Victoria is these days. How often does the mains electricity fail? Um, and how many kilowatt hours of storage would you need? So the, mo the most important thing to determine here is that the difference between kilowatt hours and kilowatts. Um, I still often hear this getting um, poorly explained even by people in the industry, funnily enough, but you know, 13.5 kilowatt hours of storage is how long the battery would run with certain appliances running, but how many kilowatts you can use, it's the equivalent to, with kilowatt hours being the petrol tank um, and kilowatts being the accelerator. So if you wanna run an air conditioner and an oven and a microwave all at the same time, most batteries won't be able to run all of those things at the same time. So it's actually really important to know this kilowatt hours of storage, but it's equally important to know how many things you can run at the same time and design your solar and battery system so it only runs essential loads through a period of time where there might be an outage. So you can prolong your battery for as long as possible. Um, is the battery in a protected environment? Um, we have seen, you know, the Tesla Powerwall battery, I think is IP56 rated, so it can handle direct water from a nozzle. 
um, but it is better off in a protected environment that it's uh, out of the way of dust and direct sunshine and water ingress, um, if possible. And it's also got some temperature uh, restrictions as well when um, they're installed in a shed in summer, for example, most batteries just don't perform as you would expect. Um, and how much reserve should I leave in my battery? That's an interesting one. They'll use Tesla as an example again. You can set a minimum reserve so that you always have 25% left in your battery um, in, in any situation. So if the power goes out at 6.30 in the morning and you ha haven't had any solar generation all night, typically that means that you've flattened your battery and you don't have anything at a time where you may need it. So you, you can change the reserve so that you never take a certain percentage at the bottom of the battery and it's always left in an emergency situation. So it's really helpful in that sort of situation. Uh, and how do solar panels perform in heat waves? Um, sometimes I think this industry gets too worked up about performance or um, efficiency of solar panels. We're talking about minuscule differences. But one thing that does make a big difference is the temperature coefficient and how solar panels perform when it's extremely hot. Some panels lose 30 to 35% of their output um, on a hot day. And that does make a big impact um, through the heat of summer as well. So important to get that information and making sure that you're getting the right advice and doing your own research and sense checking what you're being told as well. Uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think it's my job now to introduce um, one of the most experienced people in the industry, uh, Glenn Morris from Solarquip. I've known Glenn a very long time. I've learned a lot from him. I don't consider myself a technical person, but what I do know, I, I thank Glenn for a lot of that. So I, um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Glenn Morris. Oh, th thanks, Andy. That's uh, a lovely handover. Um, and ditto. <laughs> I, I admire your work from a distance. Um, certainly on LinkedIn, I've seen some wonderful stories. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about really is a bit of a personal experience. Um, as um, uh, Andy alluded, I've lived off-grid for like 30 years and uh, I live in an off-grid community uh, in the Yarra Valley and we have not actually been bushfire affected directly, but um, our community in the area was. It's something I do consider though um, whenever I give people advice about uh, off-grid systems. So let me just bring up the, the slide. Here we go. All right, so hopefully you can see my green rebuild toolkit, toolkit slide with a um, lovely picture of, of uh, Mount Tullibuong where I live. Uh, I haven't got many slides, actually I've only got seven and mostly I'll be looking at this one, which is just a, a background to talk over. Um, so, uh, sorry, what sorry I, what to interrupt, um, Glenn, uh, we don't actually have your slides up just yet. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for interrupting me. God. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, maybe if, yeah, I just want to try that. I've got it. I've got it. Sorry, I'm busy talking away. And <laughs> let me just come back to it. Hang on. And uh, if this goes well to you, actually launch the slideshow, and then it doesn't go well. And got my Zoom window up, share slide. Sorry. Okay. All right. Oops. Can you see it now? Uh, so we've got it up. Um, just it's not in presentation mode yet. It, oh, it's still in presentation mode. Uh, okay. not, a, not in presentation mode yet. We can just see the back end. How about that? Um, perfect. Ah. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> You're all good. <laughs> all right. We, we, we. Yeah, so basically I've just got a few slides and I'll be talking um, over the top of this picture. Uh, mostly it's about my experience in uh, designing and living off grid and reflecting on some of those considerations when it comes to resilience and uh, uh, you know the, the threat of bushfire. Now, as a community, we've uh, been here since 1974 on top of a mountain, which is probably one of the worst places you could choose to build. Um, it's in amongst tall Regnans forest. Um, it's uh, uh, got one road in, one road out on the dry western side of the mountain. So really it's a bit of a trap. 
So as a result, uh, even from the early days, people thought about um, survival, but they didn't really think about designing their homes for survival. They thought about, you know, bunkers and, you know, really crude ways of just protecting themselves in case of a disaster. But what's happened since, certainly since Black Saturday, um, we've really started considering in terms of new builds and also upgrading our facilities. And that includes energy as well. So, um, all of the, the clusters, there's actually 70 people live here and the six clusters, all the clusters have communal underground fire shelters that meet the current requirements. So, you know, double doors, fireproof, et cetera, um, proper signage. And so people can find you in a rescue situation. But uh, coming back to the energy side of things, um, one of the key things I'd say is if you're designing in a location where you plan to be off grid from mains power, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to consider that um, you have many services that you need. You know, you need air, water, food, lighting, communication, transport, and you don't really want all of those to be in one basket of energy source, i.e., electricity. So if you've got services that can be met, um, and a good one would be water, for example, if you can actually get potable water without having to have electricity, that means that if all goes wrong, and if you do lose power, both whether it's off grid or mains power, you still have uh, water, whether it's pressurized water or just potable drinking water, those are other considerations. So um, what we designed for our cluster was actually to have a massive header tank, 260,000 litre tank up on a hill, 20 metres above where the dwellings are, uh, giving uh, a reasonable amount of pressure and so that we could still, you know, flush toilets, drink, et cetera, if we lost power. In terms of power, um, you know, the, the, the question is, should you rely on grid power? Should you rely on your own power? Or should you consider something like a microgrid, which is a community level power? Um, a lot of that is a cost consideration uh, and whether you already have an existing power to your site. So one of the things I'd probably say about um, a complete off-grid system is it's not a cheap option, but if you think about about it from a, a new build perspective, you're actually buying all of your electricity up front. So it might seem expensive up front, but actually you're not going to get any bills for 10 years or more, you know, maybe battery replacement uh, or inverter replacement so at some point of time. So you're actually prepaying for all your electricity in advance. So it really um, it's not as expensive as it looks and it's got cheaper and cheaper over time to the point where certainly in my area, uh, it's competitive with the cost of connecting to the grid uh, on day one. So I often say the payback is is day one, um, you know, depending on your scale. Um, uh, so really uh, other things to consider from a fire resilience perspective is, uh, you know, do you have multiple energy sources? So if you are completely reliant on a solar battery inverter system, uh, if any part of that failed, is there an alternative? And, you know, the obvious alternative is generators. So generators still fulfill a very useful function, uh, even though they're, you know, fossil fuel powered often, uh, but they are another form of energy that you can call upon in times of need. But I should point out that if you're in the middle of, um, you know, ember attack, the, the smoke and the air can actually cause uh, generators to fail. They can't actually get enough oxygen and so they might stop as well. So you need to consider um, what is going to be, you know, like emergency power during uh, a fire event or what is backup power or power, therefore, you know, after an event where you may have lost some of your infrastructure. Um, yeah, so I guess people often come at you know, one of the questions I often start when someone says, I want to go off grid is why? I mean, uh, is it to save money? Is it uh, because you've bought land where there is no uh, mains power? Um, is it an ideological choice that you're actually, you know, you want nothing to do with the uh, utility grid, just want to make your own green energy and live off it? Um, are you kind of preparing for the end, so-called preppers? Uh, and uh, maybe you just don't have enough power from the utility. And I call that the network upgrade problem. Uh, you might be in a rural area with what's known as a swir line where you get very poor quality power transmitted over long distances. It droops in voltage and often um, can't run much uh, you know, capacity wise. And you want more. You want a, you know, maybe a larger power supply for pumps, air conditioning, et cetera. That's when often a, an off-grid system can compete because it can provide more than at a cost lower than the utility upgrades. So that's, that's another motivation. Um, really some of the first steps is 
is it financially viable? Uh, like I said, there is a fairly hefty upfront cost to be completely off grid, though you can do a bit of sliding off the grid. So um, Andy was talking about hybrid systems, which basically means you have the grid, um, you have solar and batteries, and your solar and batteries gives you a level of independence. And you may choose to expand that uh, at a later date and uh, basically get more capacity. I've had customers who've started with a hybrid system and realized that by getting more energy efficient, they could actually stop using the grid altogether, started switching off their main switch over summer and eventually just leaving the grid. So, um, you know, that's a learning experience. Um, you need to consider the, the convenience of um, a standalone power system in the sense that you think it's yours, you think you have reliable independent power, but it still requires maintenance and some parts will require replacement over time. Batteries are one of those ones that people forget about till they actually fail and that's a large investment cost. So you should plan for some replacement of components over time. Um, there are many other forms of renewable energy such as apart from solar, such as wind, uh, hydro, biomass, etc. But frankly, uh, I think solar's won the game in price. It's really hard to compete with the low cost of solar in most locations. Don't get too excited if you live in a windy place like we do. Uh, it's still a very expensive energy source, uh, requires quite a bit of maintenance. Now, I've got a couple of pictures I, I should just click on to before I run out of time. Um, and uh, look, I actually teach this stuff. So I run courses online. Um, I do some courses for uh, professionals in the industry, but I also run courses which are for the, the general public. And it's basically understanding a solar battery storage system. I'll just flag that there. You can learn more about it um, from my website. But I have a free thing I do every Sunday. I kind of, it's a bit fun and it's a, a live stream all about tech and renewables. And there's the link to it. Um, this is a great place if you just want to join in and ask questions. And I bring in guests every week. It's two o'clock on a Sunday. And so I did one called Going Off Grid where I brought in um, a guest, uh, actually someone else who lives here at the co-op. Uh, and uh, we had a great chat. So you can go and listen to that one. They're all recorded and they're, they're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter even. So coming back to um, design, um, this is actually an electric vehicle station that we recently uh, built here uh, at my community because we are motivated by um, you know, action on climate change and wanted to do what we could um, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. But we had to consider uh, you know, the, the, the risk of loss of the system in case of um, fire. So you know, we tried to build it in a way that it wouldn't um, develop a lot of leaf litter. So the design of the roof is that there aren't lots of rails that will collect water underneath them. They're actually running with the roof rather than across the roof. It's not a very steep pitch roof though, I must admit, but uh, that is one of the things you consider is how you actually put solar panels on a roof can have an impact on leaf litter buildup. And that's just like, just as bad as um, gum leaves in your gutter as gum leaves under your solar panels. So you know, talk to your system designer about um, good design when it comes to uh, reducing litter buildup on a, on a roof. Um, we actually have a microgrid here. So we share our energy amongst seven houses. Uh, even though there's 30 homes here, only seven of them are interconnected uh, in a sharing system. Uh, that actually actually adds another level of resilience that so we have like a centralized system this is the microgrid that you're looking at here which is quite big uh, but then each house has its own independent system so um, they don't actually need to have backup generators uh, because they can always fall back onto a microgrid but it means that they can share energy as well um, so that's just another avenue of resilience that we have um, there's my house uh, it was built just as the new fire regulations came in. And uh, so everything had to meet uh, the, the new uh, standard for bushfire attack levels. And we're in a BAL, BAL I think it's 29 from memory. Um, we've got multiple services on our home. So everything from electric water heating, PV water heating, um, solar power, battery storage. Um, we have the microgrid as a backup. We have uh, tank water under pressure on a hill, um, we have food supply. So those are all part of the, the rich mixture of considering 
resilience uh, uh, as a result of calamities. And lastly, that's my community, um, 47 years without mains power. Um, we've had a lot of learning in that process. A lot of the kind of early houses that are built here were built in terrible locations in amongst thick forest that were totally undefendable and are still totally undefendable. So those people just acknowledge that they will lose their homes. So they need to consider um, other plans like saving their lives, um, uh, insurance, um, and maybe <laughs> moving. So sometimes uh, you know, your location is your biggest challenge, where you choose to, to build and where you choose to live. Anyway, there we go. That's uh, that's all for me. And back to Tricia. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm now going to try something I haven't tried before, which is getting my screen up for presentation. Um, just give me a moment here and we'll see if it works. And then I'll share it. Good. Now I'm going to be reading something. I find, find that uh, I'm going to want to concentrate on that. So I'm going to put my um, myself, uh, stop my video, and then I will read. Okay, Malakuta's Road to Energy Resilience. Um, I want to, I've shared a little bit with you already about Malakuta, but I'm going to, and as has Andy, um, there might be a little bit of a repetition here, but you, uh, you'll know that Malakuta is a remote coastal town with a population of about a thousand people, and it's located at the very far eastern corner of Victoria, about halfway between Melbourne and Sid Sydney. It's two hours from the nearest Victorian town, over 350 people, and the final 25 minutes drive from the Princess Highway is down an, an, to the end of a narrow winding road. Electricity to Malakuta is transmitted, as Andy said, via a 240 kilometer radial line. Given Malakuta's secluded location and surrounds of National Park, this part of the distribution network is susceptible to bushfire, damage from trees, variable weather conditions and wildlife. This susceptibility has made security of supply a major issue for the town. And its wilderness surrounds has also driven a desire to minimize environmental impacts and promote low emissions energy generation options. When my husband and I moved to Malakuta a de decade ago, I brought with me a desire and passion to future-proof our lives in our new chosen home. For me at the time, that meant doing things with our house that would reduce our ongoing need for outside inputs. We spent several years living in our older home, taking time getting to know it, understanding its strengths and limitations, researching, learning, questioning, also getting to know and getting involved in our community. And that is where my thoughts and passion for future proofing quickly extended to include community wide issues as well. I thus inadvertently became involved in our ongoing power issues. Before I go further, I'd like to share with you a very short description of future proving, since I audaciously suggest it might relate to all our efforts in growing resilience. Resilience theory refers to the ideas surrounding how people are affected by and adapt to things like adversity, change, loss, and risk. Resilience is typically defined as the capacity to recover from difficult life events. And haven't we all experienced that? The concept of future proofing takes a step further, as far as I'm concerned, and includes the process of anticipating the future and developing methods of minimizing the effects of shocks and stresses of future events. And I hear some of that in, in what you were just saying, Glenn. Um, where I've come to in synthesizing my past and current activities, as well as our own town and district's energy situation, is the potential we have right now to focus on future proofing, as well as our resilience and sustainability, whilst we are recovering from our recent bushfires. First, though, I'm going to go into a little bit of our community's energy history. And here's a picture. Malakuta lights up. Completing the energy grid. I'm going to read you the first um, several lines of what's, what's on that, that um, sheet. 
um, it says, we've done it. With the connection of power to Malakuta on the 29th of July, the electrification of the state has been achieved in 52 years. Victoria is now the only mainland state where all electricity consumers are served by a single supply network and pay the same tariffs wherever they live. Malakuta was the last privately owned supply in Victoria and connecting power to the picturesque Gippsland Township was no mean task. The commission had to build 51 miles of power lines from Can River through Genoa and Gypsy Point to Malakuta and erect 27 distribution substations. The most difficult part of the job was clearing the route through heavily timbered country full of precipitous ridges, gullies and snake infested swamps. Some of the trees were so big that two, two bulldozers operating in tandem had to be used to shift them. And some a bit further on it says, before the switch on, Melakuta's 140 electricity consumers were supplied from diesel generators operated by former RAF maintenance engineer, Mr. Tom Davies. Mr. Davies was Malakuta's one man powerhouse. Over many years, Malakuta has experienced significant interruption to its electricity supply, going through all of those snake infested swamps and precipitous ridges. For example, in 2011, the year we began a concerted effort to improve our power situation, there were 55 outages totaling 67 hours. The arrival in Malakuta in 2011 of Terry Jones, SP Osnet's manager of network modernization changed everything. Where previously our distributor had considered each outage as unique and independent, Terry began working with the community, seeing systems and looking for patterns in our outages, and he found them. It led to some fantastic stories, but that's for another day. In 2013, in an attempt to resolve the town's power issues, we developed a collaboration of the Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group, SP Osnet, and East Gippsland Shire Council and commissioned a feasibility study. The major takeaway for us was that being islandable, enabling the local grid to operate while disconnected from the Osnet services network was essential. However, it was very technical, very expensive, and very unusual for a town already on the grid. We clearly did not have the resources, capability, or authority to, the, to do this without Osnet services. At, the time, the, at that time, a system which operates in both grid connect and island mode would have been a first of its kind in Australia. So there were no precedents, and this brought some risk as well as great value to the project. There were certainly some challenges from both a technical and regulatory aspect to work through. Whoops. <laughs> so COVID's silver lining, I call this. Um, the picture on the top left is of the place where my daughter and the, uh, lives and uh, an image that I, I took a photo of as I came up from our safe space with the grandchildren to, um, to assist, assist others that were um, waiting for the approaching fire. Um, the one on the left bottom is about three or four months later when uh, we took the grandkids for a little walk uh, through one of the paths. And on the right hand side, about that same time, that was a walk on the beach. Um, so I say in retrospect, COVID-19 on the back of the isolation of our community after the devastating fires provided me with a bit of a silver lining. With the tyranny of distance gone, even with our almost non-existent internet, I was often able to participate as fully as anyone in community energy activities, which normally exclude me because they take place five, five hours away in Terelgan or beyond. Malakuta was able to be regularly present for the first time. Several things happened during the year that directly relate to growing our town's resilience. In mid-2020 lockdown, I was asked to be the consumer representative on a research project commissioned by, the, by Energy Networks Australia and funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to investigate the circumstances in which there's a business case for investing in distributed energy resources microgrids and or standalone power systems to enhance resilience 
in high, high impact, low probability or HILP events. Here is some of the feedback I gave to the research team after one of our, our sessions. Our Malakuta energy story is really a story of a high likelihood of numerous near misses causing relatively frequent outages rather than a 2% chance of 95% loss every 50 years across a network. But increasing resilience in the first case is just as important as it is in the second for the residents of small communities across the nation. Resilience for a lot of communities is about more than just the imp high impact, low probability or large natural hazard events. For many of Australia's thousands of small towns, that event occurs in the midst of an already vulnerable situation and is not independent of that vulnerability. I consider this to be an additional motivation or incentive or merit for exploring local energy options, despite not yet enabled within current frameworks and regulatory settings. After the fires in Malakuta, the radial grid, now there, there are different, differing uh, numbers here, but the the radial grid itself returned 28 days after the fire on the 8th of February. A week after that, the road to the west into Victoria reopened for residents, still under police convoy. So the isolation was there and real for a, a long time. The timing was completely reasonable in the circumstance. It was also indicative of the inevitable conditions and timings for those of us living every day within a natural hazard event. Then COVID-19 in intruded on our recovery and without notice, the year got to August 28. I was preparing my feedback for one of our reference group meetings, sitting in the sun on my deck, looking up from my computer and seeing crystal clearly across the lake to the ocean with Gable Island in the distance, whilst on my computer, I can see its battery charge decreasing. We were almost 50 hours into our most recent power outage. The cause was a major storm the previous day, hours west from where we live. There seemed to be no damage anywhere near Malakuta. Nevertheless, it was impacting us. In my feedback that day, I thus challenged the high impact, low probability proposition, particularly the low probability part. Whatever the reason for this latest storm, we were now impacted by our second extended nature-caused nature outage in less than eight months. And wishing these incidents away won't change the situation for communities like ours. In the end, the research conversation shifted from HILP events to natural hazard events, far more appropriate from the on-the-ground lived experience. I fully acknowledge and understand the complexity of the situation energy networks are in the immensity of the challenges before them. It will unfortunately not be a nice smooth transition from the relatively stable past to an increasingly changing future. Some of our historical ways need to be shed in order to identify, enable and liberate the benefits of the future. I was asked to speak at the report's launch and amongst other things I said, I'm hoping communities and the energy networks can work together across the nation to make a future which works for us all. I'm sure community energy groups would welcome a collaborative approach towards a renewable energy future. We all seem to agree that it is in the best interests of our environment and our country. Many communities are committed to a renewable energy future and will be working to this end with or without the support of industry, but it would be so very much more enjoyable, beneficial and easier if we worked together. I figure that rather than this, being, this time being a transition, we are entering something more like a paradigm shifting transformation. One factor in particular is relevant. As stated in the 2020 State of the Energy Market section on electricity market in transition, the quote is, where power once moved in one direction from large generators through transmission and distribution lines to end customers, two-way flows now occur. And uh, there were other, some other, the other factors as well, but I think that is a really, really key one that we need to, um, to consider and work with and work with it. Yes, work together on. So Andy has already stolen the thunder here with uh, 3NGB. That is a picture of uh, the 
uh, past president, uh, Russell Graybridge and myself and uh, Landon Moss from RACV Solar and uh, one of the rest, the other team that uh, helped us get to a state on the 1st of October, 2020, where we could truly, well and truly say that uh, we are being as, uh, we're on the grid, but we're not making use of the grid at any stage anymore. So, um, it was, yes, we, we thank uh, RACV Solar for their response and commitment to enduring this process. As I, as I say, um, ever since that day, eight months ago, we have been attached to the grid, not needing it, self-sufficient and much more resilient. It could have been done without enormous patience and perseverance all around. And another recent uh, um, and occurrence, achievement, um, was not less, not more than two weeks ago, 12 days ago, that finally to the part of the story that's hit the media. On the 27th of May, 2021, less than two weeks ago, the media release said, Osnet Services today announced it has installed Gippsland's first community battery in Malakuta, making the town one of the first in Australia to have a grid connected energy storage system, including included in its local network. This new large scale battery designed as a hybrid system combined with a generator will keep the power running for the town while crews restore problems that occur along the incoming line. It has already operated at least twice, successfully keeping the power on for the Malakuta community. Derek Jayasuria, Principal Engineer, Osnet Services, with, here, with me here as we cut the ribbon at the launch, believes the new technology is the solid foundation to build on energy resilience for remote communities, particularly during bushfires. The Malakuta power storage facility includes a lithium ion battery with a total storage capacity of one megawatt hour and a similarly sized generator. The battery will feed power into the town during local outages. The battery brings with it the ability to island the town with the magical microgrid we previously wondered if it would ever be possible. Malakuta, uh, the Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group celebrates this as realistically the first day on the road to a totally renewable Malakuta, only a dream until the 27th of May. This liberates so much potential for Malakuta. There are also immediate benefits beyond more reliable energy supply. One major change is that all our installed solar will now work during outages down the line, providing individual owners with power, providing any access into the Malakuta microgrid for use by others, and providing support for the battery. I say it's a win, win, win. And as a bonus, it will all be logged by our smart meters and we will continue to re receive our any fed feed in tariffs. Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group intends to continue working with Osnet services wherever we can in the inevitable shift from brown coal to renewable energy. What Osnet has provided with this battery and microgrid will enable that possibility. A couple of lessons. Different motivations and reasons for action can coalesce. Osnet's, for instance, Osnet's motivation was being able to maintain Malakuta's access for electricity for enough time for Osnet services to locate and fix problems down the line. This coalesced with Malakuta Sustainable Energy Group's desire for energy resilience for Malakuta. It is also a story of keeping in touch over time. And this last slide, Malakuta's future community energy resilience, say being made possible through an enabling network of two-way relationships, just like we need our power lines to be able to do. And this is a, these are some of the, the groups that I'm involved with, supported by, um, uh, who are enabling things, who have supported us, the Latrobe Valley Authority, RACV Solar, we've mentioned, thank you, Andy. Uh, Sustainability Victoria, East Gippsland Water is providing us um, access to land. Uh, Osnet Services and the work that they've done, the Gippsland Climate Change Network, East Gippsland Shire, the Energy Innovation Co-op, 
and, and the community energy and smart grids communities that I've been able to participate in and other MSEG members have been able to participate in over the last year. Uh, Watt Watchers is the W on the screen and other small regional remote communities that have started working together across Gippsland. Um, thank you one and all. And that is the end of my presentation. I guess I should probably unsh unshare it. Um, start my, there we go. All right. So that is my, my story to this time. Um, and we'll go now, put on a different hat. Uh, Glenn and Andy, if you could come come back on, we will go into the, the, the Q&A. Um, now, here's a question. Andy, can we see Andy's things to consider slide again, please? Can you bring uh, that up? Yeah, happy to share. Are we going to be distributing this to the um, participants later as well, Tricia? Um, Certainly, the the uh, session is all being recorded, so yep. it will be available on the Renew website within the next couple of weeks. Okay, I'll bring it up again just in case, but um, okay. I should be sharing as well. Um, okay, just bear with me. Okay, is that coming up all right? Yes. Yep. Okay, there you go. Take some screenshots if you'd like, people. <laughs> There's a lot to go through. It's hard to get through it all in seven minutes, but um, you know, Glenn's touched on some really important areas as well. So between the two of us, I'm sure we'd be happy to answer any further questions you have if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or other more mediums as well. Okay. Tricia, um, I actually answered a lot of the questions in the text, but really um, it might be an opportunity to revisit some of those. Um, in the Q&A tab, there's a tab called Answered Questions. Answered. There's like 16 yes. answered questions. Can I suggest one? Yes. And I'll ask it of, of Andy cheekily. So Andy, <laughs> uh, Robert asks, how do you know um, what's the best quality solar panel to buy? Oh, gee. I have, I have heard you say that you'll, uh, when someone says, what's the best solar panel you say, I'll tell you in 25 years. Is that right? That's <laughs> absolutely my <laughs> answer. <laughs> we know each other's repertoire too well, Glenn. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's, I mean, don't ask a salesperson. And I am, uh, I am a former salesperson, so I'm reformed, but, uh, but you should always get a second opinion. And look, there are lots of, there are lots of forums online, um, there's blogs where people have given their own feedback and put data up showing performance in uh, low light, high temperature, all those different variables. Uh, there's also websites like Solar Quotes, which have a lot of um, information. In my opinion, each of those forums has an inherent bias of some kind, whether it's uh, apparent or not apparent. But I have found that forums like the, uh, the Solar Quotes website is generally pretty well regarded. Um, I've been doing this 20 years. I've seen a lot of products come and go over the years. And, um, you know, we've made a couple of small mistakes with the types of isolators we've used, but in terms of panels, we've been very fortunate that we've maybe had less than 20 panels back in the time of installing solar, which is probably 150,000 panels, maybe more out there. So um, it's, it's really hard to know, especially with the Chinese manufacturers, because sometimes what you think you're buying, you're not actually getting. They do a lot of uh, OEMing and stickering of other people's product with their own stickers. And it's a, it's a strange game. I've been into China and spoken to organizations that uh, that do uh, quality control and they said you can't afford to turn your back sometimes because the quality does tend to slip away very quickly so it's a very good question because it is a minefield out there but honestly I think the generally speaking I would say the four most highly regarded panels in Australia are probably LG, SunPower, Winaco and REC. Um, that's just my own personal opinion but I think if you look around you'll see those four brands coming up quite commonly. Um, I'm going to go on to another question I'm uh, just on the uh, a supposition that not everyone has gone into the, the Q&A and, and read your responses, Glenn, I'll, I'll ask the questions. Um, who has been manufacturing uh, this related to the, the panels for a decade or more? Of the four, perhaps Andy, that you mentioned, have they all been around for? Uh, Glenn knows this area much better than I do. Okay. 
<laughs> I actually um, gave a list of some that I know have been around for a long time. Um, sometimes that's not always the best recommendation, I must admit. I mean, we've had companies like BP Solar who started off in solar, you know, 30 years ago, manufacturing in Australia, and uh, then decided to exit the solar industry. Um, but they did leave a legacy of well-trained people and R&D that, that lives on. But, you know, you, you have to do your due diligence and, you know, things like warranties do matter. Make sure you understand the nature of the warranty and who's warranting it. Is, is it, you know, um, not worth the paper it's printed on or is it a reputable company that you can fall back on? Uh, so it's a very tough question to sort of just give a simple answer to. So hence my cheeky answer, I'll tell you in 25 years, because you can see over my shoulder there, that panel's 40 years old, it still works um, because it was made well. <laughs> I wouldn't, I'd hate to think how much it cost back then and uh, in the eighties, probably around $30 or what, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, they can last a very long time. Thank you. Um, Rob has, Robert has a, a question. How important is ventilation for lith lithium battery in a cupboard? Do you want me to take that one? Sure, you might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, it comes down to manufacturer's requirements. Uh, so the manufacturer will tell you things like the suitable environment. It, you know, it might give you an IP rating that might indicate whether it's suitable for outdoors or indoors or some small level of, you know, exposure to rain. Um, it might also tell you maximum temperatures, um, do not place in direct sunlight. Um, all of those things are listed by the manufacturer. Lithium batteries except for there are a few esoteric ones that do ventilate a combustible gas, but they're not the common ones. So it's generally not an issue in terms of uh, explosion like there is with lead acid. You've got to make sure you don't ventilate, you've got to ventilate lead acid because that will cause a buildup of hydrogen oxygen in a confined space. But most lithium batteries don't ventilate an explosive gas. That should be listed, by the way, on the safety data sheet that comes with the battery system. So if, if in doubt, check the safety data sheet. Does, does it tell you, warn you about any potential explosive gases or toxic fumes? And do some checking out before you bought, purchase, eh? Um, okay, is, John has a question. Is there a document providing guidance for a well-ventilated, sheltered and ember-proof enclosure for batteries? Glenn again. <laughs> uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I mean, I, just, I think also I responded to this one by just saying, you know, if you did want to protect a battery from d um, direct uh, attack from embers and fire, you would treat it like a person. And so you put it in the same protective environment that you would protect a person with. Uh, so they're not, you know, they're not suitable for high temperatures. They often have plastic components. Some of them will go into thermal runaway if they get too hot. So yeah, you basically would be putting it in a, a similar shelter to that you would put people in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, but, oh, we've got, well, you, you guys have been busy answering all the questions and behind. I hope that, I'm going to go through them though, because I, I don't, oh, if I'm a participant, I don't always go through the, the Q and A's to see all of the answers. So. Uh, Can I flick one to, to Andy? Um, Cause yeah, he's missed sure. out on a few. There's actually one about um, uh, vehicle to grid and EVs. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see that one, Andy? Um, how it was actually addressed to you. How important do you see EV batteries vehicle to grid? You might have to explain what that is in the near future. I'm not sure how my technological skills are with this. I did answer that question in there, but I'm not sure where it came up. So I'll uh, I'll verbalise it. Uh, so there's different types of technology. So vehicle to grid, also called V2G, uh, that will become very common, I believe, in the future. I'm very bullish about the future of that. Um, RECV being a motoring body, obviously, is uh, very keen to see the intersection of uh, transportation and renewable energy, of course, um, because that will allow us to go far beyond 100% renewables. You know, we can be putting far more than we need into the grid in the middle of the day through renewable energy with solar and wind. We can have our EVs plugged in to the grid uh, or to our homes um, during daylight hours, soaking up the excess renewable energy and then feeding that power into our homes to run our home at night. So I've been driving a Tesla P100D now with a 100 kilowatt hour battery um, for about four or five years. And that's effectively like having eight Tesla power walls in my garage. That's the way I consider it. It's not as simple as that because when you put a Tesla Powerwall as a battery, for example, on the home, it's always connected, it's always available basically, and it's predictable. But with electric vehicles, I can uh, sign up to a vehicle to grid technology to use my car as a battery, but you don't know what I'm gonna 
just decide to drive to Queensland or not plug my car in when I'm at home or, or whatever it may be, or I may need to keep 300 kilo, uh, kilometres of storage uh, of kilometres of range into my car in case I decide to go on a, an emergency work trip. So it's not a predictable technology and it's very hard to get visibility over how much of um, a resource you have in the market. So there's quite a few issues to be ironed out, I believe, but clearly it's the thing that will facilitate well beyond 100% renewables and I would love to see it become very common. Okay. Um, John uh, has said, given the detrimental effect of smoke on PV performance, would you recommend installing much larger arrays than normal? Andy. Uh, I think I saw Glenn's response to that, which I agree with, which is uh, oversize, oversize, oversize. It always makes sense. The, the, mm -hmm. the falling cost of solar um, far and away overcomes the dropping feed-in tariffs. So people get really obsessed about, oh, what happens if I'm generating 20 kilowatt hours and eight, eight kilowatt hours can't be fed to the grid because the network won't allow me to export or my feed-in tariff drops to two or three cents. Honestly, mm -hmm. if you look at the cost of a solar system and the return on investment, it has never had a quicker return on investment than what it does now. Um, prices have fallen. We still have subsidies in Victoria, for example, um, a couple of different subsidies. So it does make sense to put more solar on the roof than what you may need, especially if you have an inkling that you're going to be moving more towards electric um, appliances in your home, taking gas out. And then obviously when you move to an electric vehicle, then it will become about how many kilowatts can I fit on this 40 square meters of roof space? That will be absolutely the only thing that matters. So all of those old 175 watt sharp and BP panels out there will automatically, it'll make sense to take them off the roof and replace them with 600, 750 watt panels, whatever it is at the time, and just get the maximum amount of solar on the roof. And by that time, hopefully we have, you know, electric vehicles and other you know, hot water um, pre-cooling or heating the house if your home is thermally efficient enough to maintain that temperature. There's a number of things you can do with excess solar, but I've never heard someone say, I wish I'd gone smaller, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Trisha, can I just do a follow up on that one, but also point out there's some new open questions on the open tab. So you might want to have a little gander at those. Um, yeah, look, the, the ATA back in the day when they were called the ATA published a, a document uh, which was looking at the cost of, of solar. And I love the title, Bigger is Better. Basically, they, they pointed out that it doesn't matter if you export energy at a rather poor export tariff rate because you are self-using more and more on less than ideal days. So if you're grid connected, you know, having a very large system means that on an overcast day, you're still completely renewable. It's not just that, you know, sizing it for the peak of your demand. But with off-grid, yeah, it's changed people's thinking. So, I mean, I'm, I was from the school of you always needed a backup generator off-grid, but we're now seeing people put in such big solar systems, they can go, I don't care. I mean, even if we did have a black event, we'll be right by nine o'clock in the morning. It'll come back up and bingo. So they just, um, you know, spend the money on the renewables, not on the non-renewables. Okay. Uh, question from Elise is, can someone please step through the basic elements you must consider when building off-grid, no mains available in a bushfire prone area? Where can batteries be stored, et cetera? All right. A few starter thoughts. I think that's more than we can, we can uh, take on in a session like this, but some starting ideas. That one's for you, Glenn, I reckon. I think okay. so. <laughs> uh, uh, look, it all starts with energy efficiency. The less you need, the cheaper it is. So start with energy efficiency before you start going down building the biggest system you can imagine to run the most inefficient appliances you've got. So start with really closely looking efficiency. It saves you money from day one. Um, uh, make sure you use someone who knows what they're doing to design your system for them. It's not a DIY project. Uh, you know, I came from the DIY world 30 years ago. That's, <laughs> I got better at it. Um, but there were some terrible DIY systems in Australia up until really probably 15 years ago because of re lack of rebates and incentives. So get someone who knows what they're doing to design your system. Um, Off-grid really is a bit of a lifetime relationship. You know, your customer never goes away. They'll ring you on Christmas day to say it stopped working, Glenn. So make sure it's someone who can, you, you know, you can trust that they'll be around to service that system in the future because things will fail and it is your essential power. It's not like a feel good thing. It's all you have. Um, 
But when it comes down to the logistics of all the, the specifics of where you put it, I mean, that really is uh, up to the, you know, a lot of factors with too many to answer here. You know, are you in a certain bell zone? Um, uh, uh, you know, how reliable does it need to be? Are you prepared to go without power, but have a, you know, a generator that you can pull out of a cupboard and get things going again? All of those factors have to be weighed up. Great, thanks. Um, Liz has a question for both of you. Have either of you had problems with Selectronics SP Pro warranty? Um, she was left high and dry for quite some time and uh, had to fight to get them to send out a new COM board. So um, any, any thoughts about that? It's probably something quite specific. I'm not sure you, do you choose to respond? <laughs> It's a, it's a tough one. You don't know the specifics of it, but I mean, yeah. I, what I can say is uh, Selectronics, an Australian company, been in business 55 years. Um, they, they made one of the you know, first sine wave inverters in the world. They're here in Melbourne. They manufacture here in Melbourne. You couldn't get more local and more Aussie, basically. Um, mm. You know, sure, there may be dispute over, you know, a product not achieving what the customer expects um, or it's failed. I don't know what the circumstances were, but I feel very confident that, you know, they're a, they're a company I trust. I would absolutely uh, echo your sentiments, Glenn. Uh, again, not knowing the situation, the specific situation. And I know off-grid's a complex game. We've installed thousands of batteries out in the field and we've had um, situations where um, the batteries might not have been treated as um, they were supposed to be in the warranty conditions. There's always gray areas, so I don't wish to turn stones. But I would also echo your sentiments that my experience dealing with Selectronic over 15 years in my experience, um, yeah, I mean, they have product failures like everyone, but I've always found them to stand behind their product and... Often I'm not looking for the most reliable product. I'm looking for the company that will support me if there is an unlikely event of an issue. That's that's they, they get a chance to prove that they will stand behind the product and they always done, have done so for me. Great. Um, Valerie asks, uh, I'm on a farm and the way things are predicted, I will need an electric road vehicle, a four wheel drive farm vehicle and a tractor at minimum, plus run pumps, workshop equipment and a small cool room. How many panels and batteries am I going to need for the vehicle charging alone, let alone the rest? Um, um, the, the, look, I can only give cheeky answers because it's really how long is a piece of string. You need to know. Yeah, that was my answer. I could. <laughs> yeah, you need to know what the energy demand is. So a very detailed analysis. I mean, uh, look, I teach a five-day course on this. It's not something simple. And it all starts with understanding the loads. You need to know what the customers, you listed some things, but we need to know how many hours per day, how many kilowatt hours of energy they draw, what's their maximum demand in terms of power, um, how many days of autonomy you need. All of that goes into you know, a magic spreadsheet and out the end comes you know, a size built to give you a level of reliability and the cost may then be unaffordable. So, you know, you've got to find that match between what you wish to have and what you can afford. Yeah. If I, if I had a dollar for every time we quoted an appropriately sized off grid system and the customer says you're $15,000 too dear, I say, well, in all honesty, if that's the way that you see it, then you, you don't quite understand how off grid works. It's not about being too dear. Some companies are prepared to, um, you know, maybe they don't make as much allowance as they should. Um, you, what you do, you, you need to size up every appliance that you possibly could be running in the house and then add 15% for buffer and then allow the weather. What happens in the middle of August when it's three degrees and hailing for a week? There are a lot of contingencies you need to put in place. Uh, you need to have a backup generator. You always have to have backup because sometimes things fail. So um, it's, it's very tough. I've even had situations where I've installed an off-grid system that was well-designed for a home. The customer moved out, someone else moved in and rented the place and put oil heaters in the room and they rang me and started going off about the system not doing what it was supposed to. It's a very, very tough game to be in sometimes because it doesn't matter how much you cover your bases, um, things change and um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of grey areas, I suppose you'd say. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like quoting a house for the three little pigs. It depends which one. <laughs> and, and the energy literacy, how, how, how much energy are your appliances using generally just starting from there and working, you know, working, working through your house. I mean, I have, I have a power mate that I lend out to, to people, something as, as simple as sticking that behind uh, your fridge and, you know, on your computer, where, wherever you can, so that you start to get a sense of how much it, how much you're using. 
And, Tricia, you'd be my best customer just saying those words. I have a power <laughs> mate and I've measured my fridge because you actually get interested in energy and you start to learn about it and you can learn about how to use less of it. And then you give the right information to your system designer. Absolutely. And learn to read your, have someone help you learn to read your electricity bill. Or for those of us, Glenn, who have electricity bills. Um, yeah, um, Andy or Glenn, Kim asks, uh, can you comment on the options for PV panels at the end of their life or that have been damaged or have to be replaced? Uh, disposal or recycling? Uh, do you want to take this one here? Lotus Energy, I suppose we'd refer to there. Yeah, actually, I did an interview with Anthony from Lotus Energy on my show just two weeks ago um, on Toolbox Tech Talk. So I was really excited when I saw on, on LinkedIn uh, Lotus Energy in Melbourne uh, recycling solar panels. Now, I should point out that really the best thing is to get good quality panels that you don't have to get rid of. Um, the next is to reuse them in innovative ways, and that may be as electrical products or like camping applications, or it might be as a building product. I actually have built quite a few um, shelters around my property here using old solar panels. I mean, they're not a perfect roof. You've got to put a bit of silicon in the gaps, but, you know, they're glass and aluminium. They're all, they don't need painting. They won't rust. They'll last a long time. Um, I've used them as shade awnings on the side of the house too. Um, so find reuse, but ultimately there'll be certain products that you just can't use them anymore and they'll need to be recycled. So in Victoria, it's e-waste. You can't put it into the waste stream. So you either store them or you pay for them to be um, recycled. Um, cost at the moment is, you know, it's about $10 a panel, depending on how big they are and how heavy they are to recycle a solar panel you've got to get them to the site so there's places in melbourne there's places in south australia i think there's more opening up in new south wales that know about queensland um, but they're actually turning it back into minerals so they're, they're getting the silica from the glass they're getting the aluminium and a composite of the plastics and turning them into um, usable materials again and, and further to further to that too because i do get this question off the back of this one a lot uh, in terms of batteries um, some of the battery manufacturers are taking the, say, lithium ion batteries back and recycling up to 95% of them in the factory. Um, we're also seeing now an increasing market where an electric vehicle battery, once it loses efficiency, can be repurposed into a home battery storage situation because efficiency is obviously critical when you're trying to drive 400 kilometres, but it's not as important if you have a shed where you can just put in banks of less efficient batteries and just have more of them. So we are already seeing some innovative ways to try and extend the lifespan of batteries, for example. Um, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on end of life, but I think there's ways to realise more of the lifespan of a battery uh, once it comes out of an EV, for example. Can I pick up on that one, Andy? Once again, I'd actually interviewed Re-Electrify on my show a couple of weeks ago. They're a Melbourne company uh, who've got a technology that two of their PhDs came up with. It's got uh, it's underwritten or supported by companies like Microsoft. That, you know, that's a big deal. Is to second life batteries and exactly what you said. Take an EV battery that's down to eighty percent of its original capacity and that's end of the warranty, and then turning that into an energy storage system that could be grid side. It could be you know in a home uh, and it can mix and match. They can use all different sorts of batteries within the same system using their technology. So we've got a lot to squeeze out of those batteries before we have to recycle them. Absolutely. The first battery system I, I saw here in Malakuta was one of the other members, a, an old member of um, the Sustainable Energy Group. He was getting um, the used batteries from um, uh, wheelchairs, um, electric uh, mobility chairs. And he had a, a string of those that uh, that ran his his house, which was uh, those were quite small batteries. But he he managed to work it all out so that he was successfully getting all that he needed. Um, Tricia, there's all. I just saw a great question come through there about yeah. someone who's rebuilding in a bushfire situation where the trees are currently obviously very low, but they they will obviously grow in the years to come. So where should they position their solar panels? Uh, mm -hmm. to allow for what happens in five years' time when the trees are more mature? I think that's a really interesting question that probably doesn't get enough um, attention. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some drone modelling programs where that we use, for example, where you can fly around a, a property and take 110 high-res images and build a 3D model of the site. You can then lift the trees up in the simulation and show that if the tree grows by five metres, this is the impact in July and August on that solar array. This is even maybe the percentage of loss you'll have from the, from shading. So it's a very complex issue because you have to try and work out what type of tree, how high will it grow, 
and then start to do your calculations um, from sun, sun, sun angles in summer and winter. But there is software around that is able to do that. Um, and then it's also about things like if there's going to be partial shade, then you might want to have individual inverters on each panel rather than a single string inverter. Um, and some string inverters are actually quite good now at performing well in a shady situation. Uh, panels are getting better with separating the bottom from the top of the panel and bypass diodes, all those types of things. So there's a number of ways to get around shade. And I'd say the system that's well designed now will be potentially three times more efficient than a system that we would have installed seven or eight years ago when we didn't have the know-how and we didn't have the technology available to us. Can I suggest a really basic tool? Um, Sunseeker, it's just an app. <laughs> which the customer can put in 3D mode and go and um, just point it uh, up at the sky and it shows you where the sun will be for the different seasons of the year. Um, won't work inside, of course, but um, yeah, that's like, I think about an $8 app. So it's a little bit expensive, but there you go. You can kind of get a rough idea. It's not as elegant as Andy's solution, but if you just want to know where's the sun going to be, that's what it will do. Mm. That's one of the things that we did when we were um, working on the uh, our home, the future proofing of our home. We had unfinished floors and I just kept the, the sun's movement across times of day and days of, of, of or, you know, months of the year so that we could um, adjust our, our shades outside accordingly. Um, and it's made a difference. <laughs> It takes, it takes some time to do these things. It's not uh, decide one day and, and have it done the next. Sorry to do your job, Tricia, but I've just seen another question by Richard uh, oh. Butcher here. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> asking about whether sun, PV sun tracking uh, makes sense. Uh, my personal opinion is that with the cost of solar falling, it's, it's pretty much overtaken the need for a, sun, a solar tracker, unless there are specific um, topographical concerns that you have with shading and whatever else. So I don't know if Glenn has a different opinion, but for me, when solar was $3 a watt, it made a lot more sense than what it does now. Um, I, I've, been, I've, I've changed my mind several times um, over the years. So when when it was, you know, $5 a watt, tracking made a whole lot of sense because of the expense of panels. I, I usually had a manual tracking system and I just tilt it for seasonal adjustment on my roof of my house. Um, my next door neighbour had one on a pole that he followed the sun during the day by getting out every hour and turning the pole. It was only two panels though. Um, you get automated systems that do this, but uh, my experience of those is they generally would fail because a mechanical system... Uh, uh, the cost of it and the reliability at both just make it, you know, a no, a no brainer just to put in more panels. So really it's an economic decision often that more panels are cheaper than a tracker, but when you get to utility scale, the whole equation changes something like 70% of all the utility scale solar going in Australia at the moment is, is single access tracking. I've got one here at the lab. Um, it's a 70 kilowatt tracker and it just follows the sun from morning to afternoon. It doesn't do seasonal adjustment. Um, and it gives you a, a generation profile that's like switching on the power at 10, you know, at, at 70 kilowatts in the morning and turning off at 70 in the afternoon. It's just a big, long, flat power curve. But you need a lot of land for this. I mean, it's 90 metres long. I don't know if you have a big back garden. But uh, <laughs> so utility, yes. Residential, no, would be my summary. Um, what about uh, what has changed for you, Glenn, over the last 25, 30 years in um, the direction of your solar panels? Oh, you mean orientation, where they face? Yeah. Yeah, it used to be all about north. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be at all costs, face your panels north, on grid or off grid, get them facing north. You know, you'd argue about the optimum tilt angle a little bit, you know, bias towards summer, bias towards winter, optimum for the year. But really what's changed now is if you're on grid, it's about your consumption because you're not going to get any um, reasonable export tariffs anymore. So it's all about covering your own consumption. So you're seeing east-west as a, as a kind of very popular orientation now for on grid. That means in the morning that you'll be generating earlier and you won't be having a big peak in the middle of the day when you're probably not at home. And in the afternoon, you'll be generating for longer, particularly, you know, those hot summers uh, days. But I like to call south is the new north because there's no solar panels on the south side of your roof and it still works as well. So basically every facet's good. Um, evaluate them for your load profiles, but, you know, don't put out, uh, don't don't ignore the the, the least, desirable like south it can still work right that's enabling for some houses that are, are just not oriented uh as you would traditionally think 
would be suitable. So I guess if you're, if you choose, if uh, more is better, then uh, there's an over, there's an overkill sort of uh, happening as well. Um, there's a, a question here, which, which battery storage systems are compatible or incompatible with micro inverters? Andy, you, uh, you. Oh, well, I, I would say that any AC coupled battery um, can work with a micro inverter, basically. I mean, I, I don't mean to be a Tesla fanboy here, but that is one battery that comes to mind because it's the most popular. It has its own battery inverter, so it can be retrofitted to any any crappy old inverter that was installed circa 2011 and is just hanging on for dear life through to any micro inverters that have been installed today. Um, you don't have to pair the battery to the inverter. It works off its own uh, software and hardware um, and integrates seamlessly. So the difference in DC and AC coupled, we won't deep dive on that now, but, but an AC coupled system has its own inverter and can work uh, separately. Right. Um, specific question, living off the grid and 30 minutes from a town on a hilly road, what would, be, what would my power requirements be to charge a basic Tesla? Assuming 90 kilometers approximately approximate daily. We live in the Strathbogie ranges with limited sun in winter and we dearly love an electric vehicle, but wondering how easy it would be. Can I take that one? Because I live on a hill and okay. I do almost exactly that, about 90 to 100 k's a day with an EV. And so we live on 700 metres above the town, so it's a big hill. Um, uh, going down the hill, we actually charge the battery the whole way, so we end up with 1% to 2% more than we started with, so it's a win. If you never come home again, it's great. Um, <laughs> going back up the hill, we use about 6% of the battery's capacity and it's 64 kilowatt hour battery. So it's a, it's a Hyundai Kona electric. So 6% of um, 64 kilowatt hours, I can't do that quickly in my head, is the amount of energy that it took to go to town and come back again. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Benefits and cost differences between mounting PV panels on the roof versus on the ground. Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it, it does depend on the size. So um, for a small system, you, you have a fairly large sunken cost, pardon the pun, in putting ground frames into the ground. Um, for a larger system, it may make more sense. Um, you know, the trenching and all the other bits and pieces that go into a project, whether you're installing four panels or 40 panels, uh, pretty much the same, except for the size of the conduit and the cable, of course. So, I mean, re generally speaking, we, we only do ground mounted systems when there is no roof that's free of shade uh, and it's just not suitable to go on the roof or the customer just absolutely does not want it on the roof and, um, for, you know, aesthetic reasons. Um, we, would in, we install about 40 something systems a week in our business. And I would say we probably do one ground mounted system. So not unheard of, but there are a few situations where it makes economic sense. There's usually some other compelling reason why customer wants to go that way. Okay. Can I add some? Yep. Um, so things to consider with ground mount is vegetation management, like stuff grows up or underneath it. So, you know, you might actually have to mow around to keep your panels working. Um, you've got to protect them from stones. You know, so mowing with a slasher, you might break a panel. You will often have to protect it from livestock. So, you know, goats will chew your cables and conduits. So there's a fencing cost as well sometimes. Um, uh, and if it's a, in a bush for a prime area, um, a grass fire will wipe out your rain, no trouble. So it will just burn straight through underneath it. So being able to protect it from fire, that could mean gravel. So that gets really expensive. You basically have to, you know, have a whole gravel yard where your panels are to keep the grass away. Right. Okay, there's a, this may be the last, last question, but a couple of slides to go through before the end of the, the, um, uh, the webinar. Um, he asks, we are living in the Blue Mountains. The bush is only 10 meters away. And ember attack is a real issue. Although we had low wind and no ember attack during the bushfire of December 2019, we also have large mature deciduous trees near the house and the roof is very high. We see leaf litter as the main problem with solar panels. What other issues might we consider if we want to go solar? Andy. Um, I think Glenn's, Glenn lives in a pretty similar environment. I think he's a good one to answer this. 
<laughs> uh, I used to live in the Blue Mountains actually before I moved here. So I know the area and I, I actually had fire burned to my property boundary. Um, gosh, you know, sometimes you just have to be insured and go, well, we probably lose the house. You know, there's some undefendable homes, uh, unless you're rebuilding, you know, to a very high standard. Uh, so, um, you know, leaf litter is a, a problem if it builds up underneath solar panels. I think I mentioned that in my presentation, uh, as it is in gutters, et cetera. So it's been maintaining the hygiene basically of your roof, keeping it clear of combustibles um, is one of those main considerations. And you said you've got large mature deciduous trees. So it'll be an um, intermediate problem. They all dump their leaves, you know, at the, at the end of uh, spring, uh, end of summer, autumn, and you'll have to clean the roof and then you've got, you know, some sun through the deciduous tree branches. Uh, that can be a problem too, because actually small branches still cast small shadows, which will impact on the performance of a panel. Sorry, um, just before we do finish up, Tricia, can I just answer one question by Jenny George there, which is there a website to find the most efficient household appliances for off-grid? Because I think that's a really critical. The amount of people that don't actually do the research and they buy a cheap TV they find for $900 and then realize that it uses three times the power of what it should and it costs them far more than that in extra solar panels off the grid, happens all the time. So it's an important question. Um, there are websites that have all this information at your fingertips. I think it's energy.gov.au. Uh, Energyrating.gov.au. I yep, just put it in the, the Oh, chat. right. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. So that information already exists. It's a wonderful resource and it can quite often makes more sense to spend an extra $500 on a highly efficient appliance and you'll save yourself three solar panels uh, by making a smarter decision if you're living off the grid. Right. So that's They've made it a little rating. less accessible, though. You've got to find the registration database now. You've got to burrow down to it. It used to be right on the front page, but, yeah. That, that name, again, is energyrating.org.au? Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, gov.au, gov I think it is. Yep. .gov.au. Okay. Yep. okay. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to go a little bit over. It's 7.30 now. We've got, uh, I'll say thank you to Andy and Glenn for your contributions tonight and answering all those questions uh, and your presentation. And thank you also to everyone participating. You've uh, made the evening most in informative and uh, enjoyable. Um, I'm going to walk you through a reminder about an upcoming event in July and our schedule for the next two sessions. Um, the, a series of speed data sustainability expert events will be held as part of this project. These events will provide the opportunity for people who are rebuilding to sit down with experts, uh, designers and builders to discuss their plans one-on-one. -on -one. Starting in July, bookings for these events will open soon. People rebuilding will be given preference. And the last is um, for for the final two presentations, uh, what I, I don't have them up here. Uh, so it's water storage and resilient landscaping. Yes, landscaping. And then retrofitting for fire resistance. So um, those are tomorrow night is landscaping and retrofitting is uh, on Thursday night. So get yourself registered if you haven't already and we'll see you again at six o'clock tomorrow thank you all for attending i hope we'll see you tomorrow and our webinar will now close <laughs>